read a poem. Uh, it's called An Open Prayer to William Butler Yeats. It's the title. And um, the poem, of course, uh, I also had the, the experience of, um, of uh, going to Stony Brook uh, in New York. Uh, and they house the Yeats Library. Uh, North American Yeats Library. So I had a lot of exposure to Yeats and a lot of Irish Americans and a lot of wannabe Irish poets, including myself. Um, a couple things. This is I call this a literary poem only if, if people have not read Yeats or know anything about his life. Uh, he had a, an obsession with a particular woman, Maud Gunn, and um, uh, he pursued her for many years, and fortunately, she said, I never <laughs> married him, which was it kept him as a dreamer, which, of course, that's what Yeats is. Uh, he also had uh, a connection to uh, Madame Blavatsky and her group, which is at the end of the uh, beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century mystical group. I'm not quite sure how to explain them right now, but uh, people like uh, Harry Houdini and others were part of the group. So they're referenced in here just uh, as a heads up. Unlike you, I have no tower of symbols, no great lust for Helen of Troy, no Maud Gunn to fall madly over for years, and no Madame Blavatsky, thank God, and all seven orders of angels. Just this rose, this skinny bush climbing my porch, thorny green with rouge red flowers, half wilted now from the hundred degree heat like blotches of dried blood. They are more a symbol of poor watering than anything mystical. Still, I won't let them go, or this poem even, as night descends like an electric blanket on high, smothering the moon, a sad crescent, and these roses now drooping shadows, the blossoms gratefully erased, the thorns dulled by darkness. But this world, unlike Blake's treed angels, or your widening gyres clings to dot coms caught still buzzing in a world wide web sans spiders, patternless and consumer ridden. So I pray for your help, my dear Yates. I'll take one fake fairy or one occult fib, even some mumbo jumbo automatic writing, new metaphors or dead for any vision. Even with glasses, rose colored or cracked, is better than no vision at all. And just to follow up on that, he also had wrote poems about fairy and fairyland, and so a lot of his Irish mythology came and came to me in that too. I'm going to read a, another poem here um, that has to do with, uh, since we just had a spring snow and we're having another one. <laughs> I think as I speak, it's coming in tonight. Um, this one is called After Neruda. It's after uh, a spring snow. Pablo Neruda being uh, the great Chilean poet, uh, so inspirational for me in so many ways. He, no one could write more sensually, I think, uh, without spilling over into you know, a graphic or pornographic writing. It's marvelous, sweet, great stuff. So uh, with him or his, that idea or that sense of vocabulary in mind, um, I wrote uh, a poem about spring after spring snow came. To squeeze time like some fat orange pulpy between my palms, the rind grinding into rough peelings, the juice a taste of space itself, neither syrup thick, a sky dotted, clotted with stars, nor thin as grain alcohol, gone as it pools in a flame of dry air. Spring isn't a time, but an invitation to embrace the fruits of decay. What's left to do but drink in the citric moment, so the fruitless boredom that hangs heavy on the unconscious falls to rot where it may, only to gather again anew the bunches of snow and find the cold pav pavement ripening with prints, paws, soles, and canes, first tastings of the earth. Thank you, Pablo Neruda. <laughs> if I may, I want to... Uh, Rita, some of my poems have to do with, um, I get inspired uh, long after the fact. So I had read uh, John, Updike, John Updike many years ago and A Rabbit Run, if I remember. I didn't read the, all the rabbit series. Um, I somewhat um, mocked him in my mind, silly young man doing that. I thought he needed to be more, where's the big story? And yet, as I got older, I realized, oh, the big story is the little life, I like to call it. So with that kind of thought, as I grew up, um, I 
put myself in, in a place, uh, more of a, an imaginary place than me. So when I say it's a love song of a homeowner, um, I am playing with the idea of, of someone like John Updike writing an epic poem about being a homeowner, or myself, I should say. So this is called Love Song of a Homeowner. Why is it you always feel as if you should be somewhere else? Not just outside these pale walls, out from under this sun-wounded roof, shingles like scabs that won't heal. Past the closet of button-down shirts, press blue mirrors of each other, the khaki loose pants, tan always in style. The wife comments from behind the bathroom door, whispers of blush brushed on, clink of tweezers on the sink. It's the omniscient narrator that sticks in your head as you drift outside where it's genuinely bright and the sunglasses are God knows where. So you squint to the car but have forgotten the keys and rather than go back to retrieve them, the sound of water and tooth brushing, you continue walking down the driveway past the sprinkler, it should be moved, and unconsciously further away from the property than you've been since you bought the place. Only twice before, when the terrier was missing and mistakenly you thought the neighbors might know. The other time, when was that? That only once summer night stroll, the two of you when she was eight months along and couldn't go far. And now, past that, heading around the corner, turning away from the main avenue, the route to work and groceries and videos on Saturdays but left and then left again toward the sewage treatment plant on the edge of town, lit like a constellation. You don't linger, but cross instead the road to where fields are, old farmland, corn, alfalfa, hard to say, broken glass for a while, crumpled cigarette packs, bleached out in the moonlight. It's that late already, but bright enough to find your way. There's a breeze with the smell of woods that stand at the edge of the river. It's scree, roadless banks. Not even fishermen come here, but that's where you enter the water. It clings to your pants like saran wrap, but not too deep, knee high, a slow wade to an ancient skiff tied to the cattails. An oar inside, you half climb, half roll in, lean over the side, grabbing the rope and pull to the knotted end. Untying it, you let the boat drift on its own. Let the river take it slow without obstacles. The sky overhead riddled with stars. You guess at a few until there are none you can recognize. But it doesn't matter as you lie down on the bottom and dream of wind that will blow you to kingdom come or down the river to where it dumps into the sea. You'll roll then like Odysseus, cur cursing ancient gods to get their attention, to hurl lightning at you, to wreck on some unknown island, to be found by some nymph who will bathe your salted bones, offering you wine, and if not eternal life, then to die in her gold braceleted arms, mortgage free. You. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> really, thank you, Mark, for having me. This is great.